Well, a few months ago, my, one of my daughters asked me a question. She said, Dad, if you were on a jumbo jet and the pilot somehow suffered some kind of medical emergency and there was no one else on the flight willing to step up to the cockpit and take control, would you do that? And I said, well, of course, that's what men do. And she snickered to herself. She, she had seen some kind of study where the same question had been asked to men and women, and most women would say no, most men said yes. And then the follow-up question is, do you think that you could land the plane? And I said, yes, I think I could. Now, I have no aviation experience whatsoever, but you know what I'm talking about. In fact, there's a little bit of a intrigue with that, that we'd want to try it at least to land the plane if we were put in that kind of a situation. In reality, though, we think better and realize, no, if somebody else can do it who has aviation experience, that would be better. But it actually did happen a couple of years ago, but not with a jumbo airliner, but with a Cessna. On its way from Florida to the Bahamas, a certain air traffic controller by the name of Robert Morgan received a distress call. The passenger, one of several in this small single-engine Cessna 208, had reported that the pilot suffered some kind of medical emergency he was unconscious, and then no one in the plane could fly a plane. No one had any experience whatsoever in flight school or beside a flight instructor. Immediately, Darren Harrison took control, and Robert Morgan, the air traffic controller, proceeded to give him instructions as to how to control the flight. They first had to find the flight. And then after the flight was found by radar, they then proceeded, or Robert Morgan proceeded to give Darren Harrison instructions about how to ascend, how to descend, how to turn the plane, how to keep it level, and so on and so forth. All along the way, Darren had to rely exclusively on the instructions of one who was not beside him in the cockpit, who couldn't read the same instrument panels, couldn't look at the horizon from the windows, but was in an air traffic control tower. It is almost impossible without any kind of flight instruction to land a plane. Robert Morgan decided to steer the plane or to direct Darren to direct the plane to Palm Beach International Airport. It had the biggest runway in the area, so that was the biggest opportunity to attempt a landing. Based on instructions alone, Darren Harrison landed the plane flawlessly. Now, what happened in that situation serves as a good illustration of what Solomon attempts to teach us here in Ecclesiastes chapter 8. We have to realize the limitations to our wisdom, the limitations to our experience, the limitations to our know-how, and we must learn to live by faith, to walk according to the instructions of someone whom we do not see. And that's what we find in Ecclesiastes chapter 8, and I'm entitling this study of this chapter, 17 verses, as insights for living, as Solomon covers a lot of territory here, but as he does, he reminds us of some important truths he has already raised and, and helps us understand how to apply these things to practical living. We're going to look at six sections of this chapter. It begins with a statement in verse 1 which serves as a hinge from what, the, what Solomon just stated at the end of chapter 7 as he emphasized the limitations of wisdom. Our first focus here in verse 1 is on this. Solomon gives us instruction to seek that which brings joy. Seek that which brings joy. Verse 1 of Ecclesiastes 8 reads as follows. Who is like the wise man, and who knows the interpretation of a matter? A man's wisdom 
illumines him and causes his stern face to beam. As we noted last time in chapter 7, chapter 7 concluded with this emphasis on the scarcity and limitations of wisdom. Solomon had said this in verses 27 to 28. He said, behold, I have discovered this, says the preacher, adding one thing to another to find an explanation, which I am still seeking but have not found. I have found one man among a thousand, but have not found a woman among all these. What Solomon is speaking of here is the scarcity of of true wisdom. And then in verse 29, he explains why wisdom is indeed so rare. He says this in verse 29 of chapter 7, behold, I have found only this, that God made men upright, but they have sought out many desires. He then launches in chapter 8 into a new section, but he reminds us of the limitations of wisdom, and he asks two rhetorical questions in the first part of this verse. He says, who is like the wise man? Who knows the interpretation of a matter? Now, when Solomon asks rhetorical questions in the book of Ecclesiastes, you can pretty much assume that the answer is always negative. And so the answer to these initial questions here in verse 1 is very few. Who is like the wise man? Very few. Who knows the interpretation of a matter, of an event? Very few indeed. But although wisdom is rare, although it is elusive, and he has dealt with that at length in chapter 7 and reminds us of, it, of, us, of this to us here, he doesn't write off wisdom as being unnecessary or unhelpful. In fact, Solomon in the second half of verse 1 emphasizes the ongoing importance and benefit of wisdom. He says this, a man's wisdom illumines him. A man's wisdom is that which gives light to his path. It's actually a verb that is used in Psalm 19 verse 9 to refer to what the Word of God does to us. It it provides light. It enlightens the eyes. And Solomon takes that idea and says, indeed, wisdom is that which provides light. It gives light in the darkness. And he also says this about wisdom. He says, wisdom causes a man's stern face to beam. Now, what is he referring to here? Well, in light of the preceding context where Solomon has dealt frequently with the concept of adversity, Solomon is speaking to the fact that adversity will cause a man's face to furrow. It'll cause a man's face to get hard. And yet it is wisdom which will bring light, which will cause his face to beam. And that idea of causing a face to beam takes us immediately back to the Aaronic blessing that was given in Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 to 26, where this blessing is given, the Lord bless you and keep you, the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. What Solomon is saying here is that wisdom is of benefit in life's dark paths, in light of the impact of adversity on us, that wisdom will cause our our face to beam. It will bring joy. It will tenderize us. It will make us gracious. And and we can all identify with this. We know that adversity does bring calluses and thick skin. And if we just focus on the pain of that adversity, it certainly will make us tough men able to endure all kinds of difficulties, but it's wisdom in the midst of that which will make us tender men, which will make us gracious, forgiving, loving. William Barrick says, wisdom softens one's face as a reflection of a softened heart. In other words, the individual becomes more gracious, more merciful, and more forgiving. Well, that begins 
Solomon's chapter. It begins his look at wisdom and its limitations, acknowledging that there is a limitation to wisdom, but a benefit as well. And when we come to the end of this chapter, he will rejoin that effort. But let's now look at the second insight for living that Solomon provides us in this chapter, and it relates to authority. The second emphasis is this, respect those in authority. Not only should you pursue what brings joy, that is wisdom, recognize wisdom's benefit to lighten your path and to brighten your face, but Solomon gives us this insight, we must respect those in authority. He says, I say, beginning in verse 2, keep the command of the king because of the oath before God. Do not be in a hurry to leave him. Do not join in an evil matter, for he will do whatever he pleases. Since the word of the king is authoritative, who will say to him, what are you doing? He who keeps a royal command experiences no trouble, for a wise heart knows the proper time and procedure. For there is a proper time and procedure for every delight, or as we're going to translate that in a better way, every matter, though a man's trouble is heavy upon him. Now, in this paragraph, Solomon provides six rules as it pertains to submission to authority. And the first one is this. He says, obey the law. Verse 2, keep the command of the king because of the oath before God. Now, the first part of this sentence is clear. Keep the command of the king. The second part is, is not so clear. Scholars wonder what this oath pertains to. Is it the king's oath or is it the citizen's oath? And it appears to be the latter. It appears to be the oath that one has as a result of the fact that he's a citizen of that particular kingdom. Whether he states it explicitly or he possesses that responsibility implicitly, there is an obligation of those who are under a king, under a ruler, to obey the laws of the land. That oath is that sworn allegiance, not to the king as a person in terms of his individual personality traits, but there is a, an allegiance that must be there because of the position that he, that he occupies. There's a second rule that Solomon gives here related to submission. Not only are we to obey the law, but we are to listen to instruction, particularly the instruction given by those in authority. Notice verse 3, the first part. He says, do not be in a hurry to leave him. Now, what is he referring to here? He's referring to the context of a king's court where someone has been summoned or perhaps someone has appealed for a hearing and the king is giving his verdict. He is giving his perspective, his opinion on the matter. And Solomon says, listen to it. Value this instruction. Don't turn your back on a speaking authority. Don't look at your watch as you're, as, as you're hearing from him. Don't walk out as he's still speaking. Your business does not supersede the importance of his business. And therefore, Solomon says, in the context of that court, he says, essentially, wait for the king to dismiss you. Now, there's a lot of applications here that we can draw from that, these insights for living, that even in our own context where we are men under authority, that there is a submission, there is a respect, an honoring of the king, honoring of the leader, the ruler, that is to manifest itself in our honor and esteem of his own words. Thirdly, Solomon says, do not undermine his authority. Notice the, the second part of verse 3. He says this, do not join in an evil matter, for he, the king, will do whatever he pleases. Now, at best, this is a reference to disobedience to something that the king has expressed a preference for. Perhaps it's even a law, or at worst, it refers to mutiny. 
that Solomon is saying there isn't a, a, poor, a place here for a, a revolution. In fact, if we look at Proverbs chapter 24 on the matter, Proverbs 24 verses 21 and 22 says this, Solomon says to his son, my son, fear the Lord and the king, do not associate with those who are given to change, referring to revolution, for their calamity will rise suddenly, and who knows the ruin that comes from both of them. That same idea is here in Ecclesiastes 8 verse 3. Do not join in an evil matter. Do not seek to be subversive. Do not undermine a, a leader's authority. That is not wise. Rule number four, do not ridicule his authority. He says this in verse four of Ecclesiastes 8, since the word of the king is authoritative, who will say to him, what are you doing? Now, that is expressed as a question, what are you doing? But it's one of those rhetorical questions that is really not a question but an answer. When we respond to authority with this, what are you doing, kind of question, we are essentially registering our dissatisfaction and disagreements. God has delegated authority. We could read of this in Romans chapter 13, verses 1 to 5, or 1 Peter chapter 2, or Titus chapter 3, verse 1. Now, certainly, there are exceptions to this. If we would read in Daniel chapter 3 or Acts chapter 4 that when the king requires sinful practice, when the king oversteps his allotted boundaries, there is a place for disobedience. But as a, a matter of, of rule, as a matter of regular living, we are not to ridicule the leadership. That We were not to ridicule the authority of our leaders. That question, what are you doing, is so easily ingrained into our sarcasm and ridicule and belittling of our governing authorities. The same question actually appears elsewhere. If we look at Isaiah, for example, in Isaiah chapter 46, that question of, of asking, what are you doing, is the question that the clay asks to the potter. And in the context of Isaiah 46, and Paul picks it up in Romans as well, that isn't a question. That is sinful rebellion. Rule number five, in verse five of chapter eight, Solomon says, he who keeps a royal command experiences no trouble, for a wise heart knows the proper time and procedure. Now, when Solomon refers to the proper time and procedure, what he's referring to is the proper time and procedure of, of lodging a complaint or lodging some kind of an appeal that is made in light of or in response to an edict from a ruler. And Solomon is saying here, look, there is a time and a place for appeal. There is a time and a place for registering complaint, but understand that, that you have to earn the right to be heard. And how do you earn that right to be heard, that right to, to register that, that appeal? And that's found in your life of loyalty, your life of submission, of keeping the royal command. And when you do, and you're known by your testimony as one who follows the requirements and the regulations, then there isn't trouble for you when the time comes to appeal. That same idea then comes through in Solomon's sixth rule here for interaction with and submission to authority when he says this, wait for the right moment to appeal. In verse 6, he says, for there is a proper time and a procedure for every delight, or as I said, better translated as every matter, though a man's trouble is heavy upon him. That second part of that statement indicates that something that the king has done is perhaps unjust, or at least it has left this individual, this man, in a very uncomfortable position. But Solomon says, look, just because you experience discomfort, just because you might have something that is unjust, that is done to you, does not mean that at any moment of the day, at any moment of that experience, you can speak up and speak out. 
He says, wait for the right time. There is a proper time. There is a proper procedure. And the experience of injustice does not allow you to work around those things. You need to follow the right pattern. In fact, he says this back in chapter 3, verse 1. There is an appointed time for everything. And part of wisdom and and successful living in this world outside the garden is realizing that there is a time to do something and there is a time which is not good to do something. Solomon tells us that even appeals over sinful decrees, over injustices, require prudence in how those things are are lodged. So, respect those in authority. Third, acknowledge your inability. As he continues in these insights for living, he now brings us to a further development in understanding submission and humility. The the previous one of submission to authority already was humbling enough for us to acknowledge that there are those who have authority over us and we have to honor that. But now he takes this humility even further And he says this in verses 7 through 9. If no one knows what will happen, who can tell him when it will happen? No man has authority to restrain the wind with the wind or authority over the day of death. And there is no discharge in the time of war and evil will not deliver those who practice it. All this I have seen and applied my mind to every deed that has been done under the sun, wherein a man has exercised authority over another man to his hurt. Solomon continues this, this, this context of authorities, and, and he, he, he applies it now to, to us in a more personal way to get us to recognize, to acknowledge our own inabilities. And he gives us six illustrations or six exhibits of our inability that are important for us to remind ourselves of regularly. First of all, he says this, you cannot predict the future. You cannot predict the future. He says in verse 7, if no one knows what will happen, who can tell him what will happen? And again, the answer to that question is, Well, no one. This is a rhetorical question. If one doesn't know what will happen, then then you can't tell when it'll happen. And Solomon wants us to recognize here our creaturely status, that we are creatures and our knowledge of the present can be pretty solid. Our knowledge of the past can be somewhat spotty, but our knowledge of the future is non-existent. We don't know the future. And that puts us in direct contrast with our creator, with God. And he's going to get to fearing God in in just a few moments here, but he's building up to this and he's reminding us how different we are from God because God alone knows what and when things will happen. Just look at Isaiah. Isaiah 46, God declares the end from the beginning and, and saying, from ancient times, these things will be done. That is our God, but that is not us. And we must recognize that inability. Exhibit number two, you cannot control the climate. You you cannot control the environment. You can't control the weather as much as the pagans today think that they can. Ecclesiastes 8 verse 8 says this, no man has authority to restrain the wind with the wind. It's impossible. Think of that. When was the last time you were able to restrain the wind. This morning, I woke up, heard the wind. I had transplanted some trees. I had wished that I had been able to restrain the wind. I couldn't. The trees were moved. They were pushed over by the wind. We cannot restrain the wind, but God is the one who does. Psalm 135 verse 7 says that he causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He brings lightnings for rain. He brings forth wind from its treasuries. That is our God. He alone can do that. Exhibit number three, you cannot delay your death. Notice again verse eight. 
He says, no man has authority over the day of, of death. You cannot prevent what has been ordained by God. You cannot extend your life one moment beyond that which God has decreed for you. God alone determines the extent of a man's days. Deuteronomy 32, 39 says, I am he and there is no God beside me. It is I who put to death and I who give life. You cannot delay your death. Let that humble you. Exhibit four, you can't ignore your enemies. You don't have that freedom. Notice what he says again in verse eight. He says, there is no discharge in the time of war. Anyone familiar with war, and there's not a lot who are truly familiar with war, but anyone who's familiar with war, who has fought in war, would tell you that there are many places they would rather be, but once a war begins and you're conscripted, you are there. And only under severe consequence can you retreat. There is no discharge in the time of war. You can't ignore the enemies. You give up your freedoms. You have to fight. And yet God alone is the one who enjoys absolute freedom to do as he pleases. And there is no enemy that makes war for him any serious issue. Psalm 103.19 says, The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his sovereignty rules over all. In actuality, God has no true enemies. Exhibit number five, you cannot escape sin's consequences. The latter part of verse eight, evil will not deliver those who practice it. Men will often think that they can harness temptation. They can make it serve them. And yet the, 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 the consequence over and over again is that sin is, is incredibly deceitful. In fact, sin is deceit because it always promises and never delivers. And there are those who think they can commit evil. They have the power to commit evil. And in some way, they'll come out better in the end. And Solomon says, you cannot escape sin's consequences. You cannot outsmart it. God alone is incapable of evil and is absolutely righteous. You are in bondage to your evil deeds. Exhibit number six, you cannot resist injustice. You cannot resist injustice. Look at verse nine. Solomon says, all this I have seen and applied my mind to every deed that has been done under the sun... Now catch this, wherein a man has exercised authority over another man to his hurt. It was Lord Acton who said power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. That is certainly true as Solomon says with us. We have seen already in chapter 7 verse 20 that there is no one who does good. There's no one who never sins. And we've seen in 7 verse 29 that though God made men upright, they have all sought out many devices. And so you give a man some authority, you give him some power, and there is this bent within us to, to use that to promote ourselves at the expense, at the hurt of others. And Solomon says, this is man's plight. This is man's inability. You don't have the capacity to, to remain free from the, the, the corrupting influence of power on your sinful flesh. God alone is one who's never corrupted by power. He's the one who, alone who wields power without the slightest tinge of injustice. That leads us now to a fourth emphasis in this section. Leave it in God's hands. Seek that which brings joy. That's wisdom. Respect those in authority. Acknowledge your own ability. And the, the, the process of humbling continues here where Solomon calls upon us in a unique way to leave it in God's hands. What's he speaking of? Let's read these verses 10 through 13. So then... 
I have seen the wicked buried, those who used to go in and out from the holy place, and they are soon forgotten in the city where they did thus. This too is futility, because the sentence against an evil deed is, is, is not executed quickly, therefore the hearts of the sons of men among them are given fully to do evil. Although a sinner does evil a hundred times and may lengthen his life, still I know that it will be well for those who fear God, who fear him openly. But it will not be well for the evil man, and he will not lengthen his days like a shadow because he does not fear God. Now, in this paragraph, there is there is the pitting of two perspectives against each other. You've probably seen that. The, the first two sentences or the first half of it are pitted against the, the second half. In the first half, Solomon operates according to what we would call observational reality. Observational reality. And he's going to make two observations based on what he sees under the sun. And, and it is here in particular where we start to see Solomon's recognition again of wisdom's limitation. Because wisdom, wisdom is dependent upon situational awareness. Wisdom is dependent upon real life circumstances. And so Solomon says, when I look with wisdom on this world, I, I see some problems that I can't resolve. And the first reality is this. Sinners appear to pass out of this life without consequences. Notice what he said. He describes it this way. He said, I've seen the wicked buried. I've been at funerals. At funerals of those who go in and out of the, the holy place. Probably a reference to the temple. These are fellow Jews. Israelites. And they're, they're wicked. They, they go in and out of the temple. They practice all the externals. What a farce. What a blasphemy. And, and then they're buried and, and soon forgotten in the city where they did these things. And he calls it futility because he's frustrated here. This is a, a vapor. This, this is fleetingness. Now, why are they forgotten? And the idea behind this is this. That what, would you, what you would expect in a situation of retributional wisdom, where there are consequences meted out upon the wicked, you would expect that these men's lives, these wicked who are buried, they, they would, their lives would serve as ongoing infamous testaments to the consequences of sin. They would live on, in essence, in a negative way. That these wicked, hypocritical sinners would serve as a, 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 a testimony of what sin does, its corrosive nature, its corrupting influence, and so on and so forth. And yet, what happens, Solomon says? So often, they're buried and they're forgotten. They, they come to a peaceful end. They don't experience for everyone else to see the consequences of their sin. He, he says, I have seen this. This is the observation and these are the hypocrites that he observes, and they are forgotten because they don't, their lives don't inherit the whirlwind. There's a second observational reality here. He, he says this in verse 11. He, he says, because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed quickly, therefore the hearts of the sons of men among them are given fully to do evil. What's the second observational reality? It's this. Delayed justice appears to perpetuate evil in the present. Solomon has, has already acknowledged that man is depraved. 7 verse 20. 7 verse 29. He has already acknowledged that God is judge. 3 verse 17. He's going to get to it at the very end of the book in 12 verse 14 as well. But he's complaining here based on observation that the wheels of justice turn too slow. They grind too late in the process. And as a result, it seems to be self-defeating in that it only serves to perpetuate even more evil. How can that be? At the observational level, trying to look on life in the full spectrum of everything done under the sun seeing the prosperity of the wicked, 
seeing how they only increase in their, in their depravity because these wheels of justice are not yet turning, that Solomon says that based on wisdom, if you try to, to reason this out with wisdom, it appears that God's patience is permissive. It's permissive. But there is a shift then that happens in the middle of this paragraph. He moves from what he sees to what he knows. There is a revelational reality here. And this revelational reality is not based on observational wisdom. This is based only on the knowledge that God reveals about the bigger picture. And the first, observ- or the first revelational reality is this, only those who truly fear God will be saved in the end. Notice verse 12, although a sinner does evil a hundred times and may lengthen his life, speaking of the prosperity, his perception of, of his life, he's not dying early because of his sin, Solomon says this, still I know that it will be well for those who fear God, who fear Him openly. Indeed, sinners may appear to live a good life. It may look good on the outside, but what is important is not what appears to our sight, not that observational wisdom. Instead, what is important is what is true. And what is true is that which God has determined and revealed to us. And Solomon here once again points to the fear of God as as the ultimate solution to this enigma. Notice he doesn't appeal to wisdom. He appeals to the fear of God. The fear of God is that which makes this make sense. The fear of God is that which is revelational in nature. In fact, if you remember from our definition given a couple of weeks ago from Charles Bridges, the fear of God is that affectionate reverence by which the child of God bends himself humbly and carefully to his father's law, to his father's word on the matter. And that's what Solomon realizes here. Only those who truly fear God, who fear him openly, who fear him sincerely, Only those will be saved in the end. And I love that phraseology, it will be well. We sing that wonderful hymn, it is well with my soul. Solomon has that moment here as he leaves aside the best he can accomplish with human wisdom and instead looks at things from a revelational perspective and hears or sees or reads the promises of God and is able to affirm that it will be well for those who fear him. That leads to a second revelational reality here in in this text, in verse 13, he says, but it will not be well for the evil man, and, the, and he will not lengthen his days like a shadow because he does not fear God. As the shadow, as the sun goes down, shadows become longer. Evil men think that they are sinning and actually extending their lives, that God is ambivalent, and, and so they have this perception that life is getting better the more they sin. And Solomon again looks looks at this from a revelational perspective, and he comes up with this reality. Those who do not fear God will be decisively judged. Although sinners think they're living long and prosperous, in truth, God controls the very moment of their death, and at the appointed time, not one moment later, the sinner will receive the full penalty for his evil. And what is his crime ultimately? His crime is that he failed to fear God. You can look at the end of the book, and Solomon will bring us back to this in chapter 12, verse 14, where he says, God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden. It also reminds us of 2 Peter, doesn't it? 2 Peter, when In chapter 3, Peter writes, the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness. And in the same way that his word 
brought a, a, about the heavens and the earth and, and how his promise is that the earth and the heavens will be burned up with fire. So he's given a, a word that there is a day of judgment for sinners. Now that leads us to the fifth emphasis that Solomon makes here in chapter 8, and it's this, get on with life. Not only do we leave it in God's hands, that, that we operate according to the promises he has made, we recognize that we can't solve all of life's enigmas, that there's limitations to wisdom, so we fear God, we bend before his law, his word, his sovereignty, his providence, and now Solomon says, now get on with life. This is what he says in verses 14 and 15. There is futility which is done on the earth. That is, there are righteous men to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked. On the other hand, there are evil men to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. He's basically summarizing what, what we've looked at already. There are crooked things that, that, that God has bent you, you can't understand those things. You, you can't resolve those things. And so Solomon says, I say this too is futility. And then he gives the response. He says, so I commend pleasure. For there is nothing good for a man under the sun except to eat and to drink and to be merry. And this will stand by him in his toils throughout the days of his life, which God has given him under the sun. Now, once again, Solomon teaches us of these unexplained perplexities. He, he teaches us that under the sun, looking at things solely from that observational standpoint, the righteous will often suffer adversity, and the wicked will often prosper. He says this in verse 14. Solomon points again, like I said, to, to what he has told us in chapter 1, verse 15, where he says, the crooked thing cannot be straightened. And in 7 verse 13, who is able to straighten what he has bent? Adversities in life are there. There are unexplained perplexities. And acknowledging this, that we can't resolve these things, is crucial to our well-being here. And that leads us then to the appropriate response then that Solomon gives in verse 15. Notice what he says, and this deserves particular attention. He says, verse 15, so... I commend pleasure. Solomon issues here another carpe diem or seize the day text. We've seen these already in chapter 2, verses 24 to 26, and in chapter 5, verses 18 to, to 20. He, 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 he strongly, in fact, commends, he strongly exhorts us to enjoy the life that God has given now, when he says pleasure here, it's important to understand it in its context. This is not just a, a statement that has been thrown in that has nothing to do with what has preceded. Solomon is addressing the God-fearer. He is addressing the righteous man who can't make sense of this world and yet bends humbly before the sovereignty of God. And then Solomon says, you know what? In, in light of the fact that that, that, that you can't solve all of these other issues, what do you do? If you continue to occupy yourself with trying to resolve those things, you never will. Instead, you will have a life of worry, stress, anger, and madness. Instead, what do you do? You realize that enigmas in life can exist right beside enjoyment. That, that there's a time you get on with life. That you know there's hurt, you know there's resentment there, there's something that has happened to you, and, and you can't explain it, and you've devoted the last however many months or years to trying to resolve this problem. So-and-so did this to me. This happened to me. It's unfair. It hurts. I don't understand why. This, is, this isn't, I don't deserve this. This, is, this isn't for me. And, and life is... Is wasted by self-pity, by resentment, bitterness, obsessing over that past circumstance. And Solomon says, get on with life. Get on with life. Stop wasting your breath. Instead, look at what you do have. And enjoy it. This is what God has given. You will never resolve those enigmas. 
You'll only waste away pining after an answer that will never be given to you in this life. And meanwhile, you pass by all the good things. Think of how many men ruin their families' lives because they obsess over something that happened to them five or ten years ago. And they focus on it and destroy everybody else as collateral damage. Solomon has given us this exhortation here to warn us of that and say, don't do it. Enjoy life. I commend you to pursue pleasure. And this isn't hedonism. This isn't escapism. This isn't abandonment of of responsibility. This is all done in the fear of God. And what Solomon is saying here is, is that when you truly fear God, you openly fear him, as he said in the previous context. You humbly bow before his sovereignty and his providence, his law. Then you can truly enjoy life. You can enjoy life when you fear God. And when you fear God, you can truly enjoy life. He's not saying this is possible when you separate those two. If you do not truly fear God, then your enjoyment will be idolatry. Then your enjoyment of these things will be corrupted. You will be given to your own devices and you will idolize that enjoyment. But when your fear is of the Lord then you can embrace the gifts that he has given and you can say, hallelujah, what a great good God I fear. Again, William Barrick says it this way, Solomon nowhere commands enjoyment of life as an anesthetic to deaden the pain of inequity, justice, and death. Instead, He focuses on the fact that human beings ought not not to waste their God-given joys by seeking to usurp the authority and work of their creator, fretting over the brevity and seeming unfairness of life brings no joy, no peace, no rest, and no solution. God's wise bestowment of all things and his benevolent providence stand behind what happens under the sun." Man, don't don't get stuck living by sight. Don't get stuck in self-pity, resentment, seeking to resolve those things. Move on. Get on with life. And that leads us to our sixth and final emphasis here, and it's this, walk by faith. It's the final set of statements here at the end of this chapter, verses 16 to 17. He said, when I gave my heart to know wisdom... And to see the task which has been done on the earth, even though one should never sleep day or night, speaking of pursuing this wisdom, he says, and I saw every work of God, I concluded that man cannot discover the work which has been done under the sun. Even though man should seek laboriously, he will not discover. And though the wise man should say, I know, he cannot discover. Solomon ends where he begin, began with a recognition of wisdom's limitations. Wisdom is a kind of walking by sight. It's it's walking by that situational awareness, the skill of applying truth, but applying it to what is beheld. And and certainly, as Solomon has said, he he says that wisdom has a benefit. It, It lightens the path and it softens the face. But at the end of the day, Even though you should seek it laboriously, it will not solve your problems. Ultimately, what Solomon is getting at here, what he's holding up to us as the most life-changing pursuit, what is going to impact us most is not wisdom, but the fear of God. What enables us to truly enjoy life is, is not learning and education, as helpful as those things are, not taking Bible class upon Bible class, as helpful as those things are, but ultimately it comes down to this very foundational gift of fearing God. And regardless of of your education, regardless of your experience, you can enjoy this life if at the foundation you truly and openly Fear God. 
One writer put it this way, the occupational hazard of the wise man is to walk by calculation rather than by faith. And that's what Solomon calls us to walk by. Few final exhortations here. As we listen to the words, these well-driven nails by the preacher, number one, acquire wisdom but for the right reasons. It's not going to solve all of your problems, but it will lighten your path and it will soften your face. It'll make you a more gracious person. Acquire it. Secondly, learn to live peacefully under authority. Stay out of trouble. Learn to live this way as Solomon describes in these six rules, and and it's going to go well for you. Number three, remember your creaturely and even sin-stained status. You're not God. And so it's important for us not to act like it or demand like it. We are not God. We're creatures. We're made from the dust, and to dust we will return. Number four, bend yourself in that affectionate reverence before God's sovereignty. Bend yourself carefully. Bend yourself with love and adoration of this sovereign great God. Five, steward your life well by enjoying God's gifts. If you're not living a life of enjoyment of the simplest things of life, you are, you are transgressing the, the, the revelation that God has given to you. Steward your life. Enjoy God's gifts. And number six, live by God's promises. Live by God's word, not by your observations. You will not be able to, to find the, the end of things. You must live by faith in what God has said. Let's pray that the Lord would make these things true in our lives. Father, we are thankful for chapters like this which deal with so many practical things in our lives and remind us of our limitations, of our need to humble ourselves and recognize that we are but dust, to fear you, to bend adoringly before you before your sovereignty, before your word, your providence. And that in that relationship, we will find the ability to enjoy what you have given. Lord, we pray you'd convict us when we look at all these good things in our lives and we fail to see the enjoyment that you have designed for them. Teach us to be men who under the fear of God and on the fear of God and beside the fear of God, with the fear of God permeating our lives, teach us to be men who run after the enjoyment of life that you have given to us. And by that, may we glorify you as the benevolent God that you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.